Hey, I'm Evan Marquette, dating coach for Smart, Strong, Successful Women, your personal trainer for love. Welcome back to the Love You podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about whether he really makes you happy. You may be surprised to know the answer. You already know the answer, uh, but we're going to explore it here today. When we're done with today's conversation, I'm going to give you an opportunity to apply to Love You um, so you could finally find a relationship with a quality man, high value man who takes care of you, loves you unconditionally, makes you feel safe, heard, and understood. Um, but where we're going to begin today is a story that has been rattling around my brain a lot recently. Um, I just had a viral TikTok video. I don't like to talk about my other social media platforms when I'm on my podcast or on YouTube, but I had a viral TikTok video. It was one minute long. It was basically telling women uh, the concept of mirroring, which is to show uh, let a guy demonstrate his efforts to you, show you why he values you, follow up with you, text you, call you, and sit back in your CEO seat and evaluate his performance. Um, this is of the same ilk. If you're a smart, strong, successful woman who finds that you have to breathe life into dying relationships, that you have to follow up with him, that you have to text him, that you have to drive the relationship forward and see where things are going, today's podcast is for you. So the overall question is, do I want him? Do I really want him? Or do I just want the idea of him? Is getting him to commit going to be an actual win? Or is it like you've been standing in line for so long that you can't bear to leave the line? I think sometimes that tends to get lost. So the story we're going to tell today is a client of mine from years ago. She'll remain Nameless, uh, she was on the East Coast, um, late 30s, early 40s, and very, very anxious about her relationship. And you would be too if you were in her shoes. See if you can sympathize. Um, she was dating a guy. She loved him in as much as if a woman says she loves a man, I'm, I'm inclined to believe her. But they were in a long distance relationship. Um, they had talked about the idea of getting married, but he didn't seem to be in any rush to do so. Um, so they're living in different cities. He has not proposed. They've discussed the idea of marriage and kids. Her clock is ticking. Um, they're together for seven years, 33 to 40 and she has her hooks in and she's waiting for things to turn around and they're not turning around. She hires me for coaching. She hires me for uh, six months to a year of our work together. And it's really hard for me to render my services because my services are about helping women choose better men who are driving the relationship forward, who let you know where they stand, how they feel, where things are going. And she is, well, stuck. And you can understand why she's stuck. She says she's in love with a man. It's seven years in. They're not engaged, living in a different city. Her clock is ticking, right? And she's saying, Evan, what should I do? Evan, what should I do? What should I do? And I don't know how many ways there are to say, dump him. How many ways are there to tell someone who is entrusting you with their love life that this man is never going to marry you, if he wanted to marry you, you'd already be married. He'd already be living in your city. You'd already pull the goldie and be working on having babies. If that's what he wanted, that's what he would be doing right now. What he wants is this, a long distance relationship with a woman who does all the work, who comes and visits him and makes him feel special and puts up with all of his bullshit. What I didn't mention, and I have my notes here, is that the boyfriend, the more she told me about him, again, he may have been, he may be a good person at heart, right? They may have had good times. They may have good times when they get together and they go out to dinner and they make love and they laugh. But the way she was describing him, the guy she desperately wanted to get a ring from and procreate with, the way she described him, he was selfish, distant, critical, he was constantly telling her what was wrong with her and why he didn't see himself proposing and how he couldn't put up with this for the rest of his life. And he kept on telling her all the things that were wrong with her. 
And all she could think of is, how can I make this man mine? How can I have this person in my corner for the rest of my life? And this person who's constantly making me feel bad about myself and gaslighting me and making me wonder where I stand and where my relationship is going. How do I make this situation permanent? And if you detect a tint of irony, that's because I have had this conversation so very many times over 20 years, and it's never, never less painful, never less painful for her, never less painful for me to deliver the bad news. Hey, I'm just the doctor. I'm reading your chart. You don't have a happy relationship on your hands. It's like you're trying to fight to preserve your cancer. That's really what he is. He's a, he's a cancer. You just don't seem to see it as a cancer because you feel like he's a part of you because he's been there for seven years. But really what we have to do is eradicate the cancer. And so again, the, the title of this is, does he really make you happy? And that's because I've noticed this propensity for women over the years to stay in relationships that don't make you happy. I just signed on a client the other day and I asked her a question about her marriage, 30 year marriage. Again, keep her anonymous. And in my world, good relationships, 90, 95% good, 90, 95% easy, supportive, the five, 10% you negotiate as a team. And that's okay. That's, that's real life. A lot of people have convinced themselves that good relationships are 50% torture and 50% happiness. Other people have normalized this. We call it the normalization of deviance and love you and normalize this to think, oh, relationships equal pain, suffering, bending over backwards, apologizing, walking on eggshells, not knowing where you stand, feeling a constant sense of anxiety and dread. That's just the definition of relationships. So my client, not the one I was telling the story about in the seven year relationship, new client who just enrolled in Love You told me that over 90% of her relationship was unhappy and she stayed for 30 years. So I really want you to do a deep dive and consider how much time have you spent in relationships that fundamentally make you unhappy under the justification that this is what love is and you have to do anything to preserve it. Because if you don't preserve it, then you're a failure. You let this relationship go, you're a failure. No, no, you're not. You're a success because you got out of something that makes you 90% unhappy. And so I think of exes in my life, people that I've been with in the past where I did the same thing. And the reason, again, I get to give this advice is because I had a lot of life experience before I became a dating and relationship coach. And I think of girlfriends that I was crazy about. I mean, really just, if they would have married me, I would have married them. And looking back, I think, wow, what a bullet I dodged. One of my girlfriends would call me names, insult me and leave me at restaurants when we got into disagreements. She was so dramatic. She would just pick up and start walking down the block or leave a party and I would have to ch chase her down. That was her method of conflict resolution. Another one after we broke up sent me hate mail, like anonymously dressed hate mail, like she was a serial killer with like the letters. And I received hate mail. I, I, I guess I don't know it was her. It was anonymous, but I got hate mail for months after we ended up breaking up. Um, there was another one who didn't have the same mean streak of these, these other women, but I was really, really in love with and, and she didn't have compassion when I was struggling. I had this new business. I didn't know how to run a business. I was formerly a screenwriter and I was very anxious about not knowing where I was going or what I was doing in, in my, my new role as entrepreneur. And, um, she had no, sympathy. She had no understanding. She had the same job for 17 years. For her, your job is just to work for a big company, collect a big paycheck. Right? So she couldn't empathize with my struggles. She just thought like, what's the wrong, what's wrong with you, man? Just get it together. <laughs> no, literally the last thing anybody would want to hear. No empathy, even though she's an empathetic person, kind, generous in lots of ways, but she didn't know what to do with that with me. And I, theoretically, if I got my way, could have married any of them. Okay. And what a life I would have had if I had a, a wife who didn't have empathy, a wife who, when she got angry, would 
leave me, a wife who, when she disagreed with me, would insult me. These are the people I wanted to marry. So I share this with you, my dear listener, my dear viewer. How many times have you fought to preserve a relationship with someone who, not that they were evil person, but they weren't a good relationship partner? How do you know they weren't a relation, good relationship partner? You were constantly anxious. You were constantly on edge. You didn't feel safe. Right? And all you wanted to do was work on it. How can I get him to lock this in? And that's what happens. Sometimes it works. You lock him in and now you're married to the guy. And now you have kids with the guy who isn't that nice and isn't that good at conflict resolution and doesn't want to listen to you. All right. This is the pattern. If I had gotten the women of my dreams, I would be miserably married or divorced by now. If I had landed any of the women in my early 30s that I thought were the one. And that is unfortunately the, the, the blinding power of love and attraction. And it is why we are here. It's why we have these similarly themed conversations each week. My client, who I mentioned at the top of this, spent and a year of coaching, right? Having the same conversation with me and doing nothing. Thinking, how do I fix this? How do I get him to change? How do I fix this? How do I get him, him to change? How do I change myself to make the man who's critical and distant and lives in, lives in a different city and hasn't proposed and doesn't want to have kids with me to want all of those things? Right. We got nowhere with her coaching because she was holding on to something that was lifeless instead of closing the book on it and realizing that she had to look forward to find a man who is self-motivated, who wants to be in a relationship, who understands the sense of urgency, who is nearby, who escalates things on his own. That is the only solution for a relationship that's not working. It is not to try to fix a partner, fix a broken relationship, change him to become the person you want him to be, and is to find someone who's already there. This is what we do in Love You. Because if nothing you've ever done has worked out, and that's usually the case when someone is listening to the Love You podcast. And it's occasional. I, I spoke to a, a former client of mine who graduated Love You, credits her with, you know, credits me with her love life. She's living with her boyfriend. They're planning a future. It's really great. She still listens to me. And I, I thank her and I appreciate that. But for the most part, people who come here have 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years of broken relationships. Definition of insanity, can't break the pattern, know the pattern, but can't break the pattern. So in my course, what we try to do is lead you through a process that allows you to stop making those same mistakes. Even if you can't see them, my job is to flag them right, and hold the ground for you so you don't invest too much time, sunk costs and energy in trying to fix something that's broken. Because the one thing that all these amazing women have in common who come to me in Love You is that they are deep feeling women who have been ignoring their feelings for their whole life. Have you been ignoring your feelings for your whole life? Have you told yourself that it's normal to feel anxious with your partner? Have you told it yourself that it's normal that he disappears for a few days without communication? Have you told yourself that it's normal to have regular makeup sex? Have you told yourself that it's normal to be on pins and needles, afraid to share your thoughts because he may get angry or he may break up with you? None of this is normal. You've normalized it. You've made it okay. You've lowered the bar for what you come to expect from men. So in love you, all we're doing is just raising the bar for what you come to expect from men and asking yourself, is this relationship making me happy? And if it's not making me happy, why am I fighting so hard to preserve it? Good food for thought. If that hit home, if that resonated with you, please go to www.evanmarkkatz.com forward slash apply. Give me your name and email address. Watch my video. All right. It's for high value women looking for high value men. You've had a broken man picker. Nothing's ever worked. This is a two-part formula that's going to show you what to do, how to do it, and how to get started. I look forward to seeing you there. Next, I want to tell you about our Love You Small Wins. As I said, I work, I'm a husband for 
I don't know, at any given time, 50, 60 women. My job is to play that role of honest man in your life who's taking care of you. So every week we have got clients celebrating their small wins. Today's small win um, comes from Jenna. Uh, she writes, even though I've been in an intense place with work, I haven't been shutting off from the dating energy and I've been continuing to communicate and put energy toward it. Before it, I would have put it off and taken the entire week off. And so that's the thing with anything in life. We just talk about dating and relationships, but I always liken this to working out at the gym. What you need to do is have a regular dating practice. What you need to do is have a cadence. You don't decide I'm going to work this week and I'm not going to work next week. You need to have a regular rhythm where you do it. So even though you're a busy woman and I appreciate that you're a busy woman, if dating always goes by the wayside because you're busy, then your love life grinds to a halt. You pick it up one, two months later. In Love You, we carve out time for dating all the time. It's a priority. It's eating and sleeping and showering and working, right? And a half hour of online dating every day. As long as you're putting in that energy, we've got the possibility of finding one special guy who wants to take you out for dinner on Saturday night. One of those things pop, you're in business. You have a lot better chance of falling in love if you go on one date a week and if you go on one date a month. And that's what consistency does. And that's why I love that love you small win. Now I want to talk about um, my recommended read for the week. Uh, I read, maybe so you don't have to, maybe you click on the links that are in the, uh, the, the show notes on the podcast or the blog or, or, or the YouTube videos. Um, but if you don't click on the link to read this, I'm going to tell you the crux of what's in this article because I always find interesting stuff that's worth sharing here. Today's piece uh, it comes from a New York Times article, um, and it was about the mindset for marriage and what it means to be part of a couple. Uh, I'm going to lead with this story because I think it's a funny story, and it's a story that doesn't make me look good, and that's usually the best stories are the ones that don't make you look good. So I'm married for, I don't know, a month, something like that. And the way we moved was, was quicker than I would recommend as a dating and relationship coach. I was 35. My wife was 38. Um, we didn't have much time if we wanted to have two kids. So we literally got married before we even had a chance to move in together. Not recommended because we were in a rush. We both worked from home. It was hard enough planning a wedding, much less finding a place to live. And so we moved in together a couple months after we got married. And so we were, otherwise we were a couple that talked every night and saw each other two, three times a week. That was what we were until after we were married and even after our wedding. So we're living together and we're exploring our new area. It's a place in, in Los Angeles called Little Ethiopia. Um, lots of cool food and culture near some really interesting things. And I'm just exploring Pico Boulevard here in Los Angeles one night after work. And I happen upon a taco truck. And one of the best things about Los Angeles are taco trucks. And so I stop by this taco truck, buy myself two, three tacos, go home. And it's eight o'clock at night, something like that. And I'm like, honey, you'll never guess what I saw while I was driving. It was a taco truck. And, and I sit down and I'm eating and she's, she, she goes, you didn't get me any tacos? And, and I swear to God, it didn't even occur to me. It didn't even occur to me that I should pick her up tacos. And not because I'm a horrible person or a cheap person or I'm a selfish person. It was because I was single for 35 years. And I never had a long-term relationship longer than eight months. I'd never lived with anyone before. I never thought for two people. So I had to come clean that no, I didn't even think of it. And that was the beginning of an education. Now we've been together, married for 15 years. I, I don't do anything without trying to run it by my wife first because we're a team. But that's a level of teamwork that is developed over time. The reason I'm sharing this story is that I'm not alone. Right? It's easy to make myself the butt of the joke and talk about the stupid taco story from 15 years ago because it's a microcosm of what happens when people are single for a long time. Who are most of my clients? 
Um, sometimes I've had clients who are married for 30 years and recently divorced and starting over and are afraid of the dating landscape, uh, online dating and dating apps and multiple people and sex. I mean, that can be pretty intimidating. But I also have a lot of people who've been single for 38 years and haven't found a life partner. Well, people who got divorced in their early 40s and have been alone for the past 15 years. And you know what they're really good at? Being independent, right? being alone, right? Taking ownership of, I've got this blank slate, it's my life, what am I gonna do with it? And that leads me to this article. Quote, secular American culture puts the self and self-fulfillment at the center of life. But in viewing couplehood mostly as a vehicle for individual self-fulfillment, we've lost the thing at the core of the romantic ideal of marriage, we. In secular America, the last sacred cow is the self. What is good for the self is good in itself. What threatens the self, whether marriage, motherhood, friendship, or family, needs to be checked. Right. And I see this a lot. And again, I'm on your team, right? I'm not telling you that you're wrong for saying, hey, I've got a rich, full, single life. I'm going to make the best of it. But then you fill up your life with your stuff. Right? And you do. You fill it up with stuff. I, I'm thinking of a client. Maybe she's listening right now. She was simultaneously in love you. She was a doctor. She wanted to be the president of the so-and-so medical board. She was buying and renovating a condo. She was in salsa class, hot yoga class, she, taking care of her nieces and nephews. She had a really amazing life and there was literally no room for a partner in it. And she was wondering, why don't I have a boyfriend? Why is dating so hard? Why am I so resistant to whatever it's telling me and love you? It's because she built something that was full and was impermeable to change. And so this is what happens. And again, I'm going to say this really gently with my clients who've got big jobs, intense passion, full schedules, really full schedules. Right? You're desperately afraid of losing what you have. I like my life, Evan. And I'm not telling you shouldn't like your life. I'm not telling you to disown what you're doing. I'm not telling you to quit your job and go on a full-time husband hunt. I'm saying everything in moderation. And when you fill up your life with all this other stuff and you don't leave room for what I'm talking about, half hour dating a day, a couple phone calls, one date on a Saturday night, if you don't leave room for that, the next thing you know, you're 50 or 60 and you still have your rich full life and it certainly beats being in a miserable relationship, but you don't have real companionship because all the things you do for yourself take primacy. Well, at least at work I make money better than going out with some Joe Blow loser, I'm gonna spend more time at work. Well, at least I enjoy um, you know, going on this yoga retreat, at least I enjoy being part of my book club, at least I enjoy you know, running on the trail with my dog uh, two hours every morning. And again, that's great, you should do all those things. The problem is you end up with one really strong muscle, you end up with one really weak muscle. The weak muscle becomes your love life. Right. It gets crowded out. There's no room for it. And it becomes once again, normal. And so I remember talking to author, uh, Lori Gottlieb once upon a time, you may know Lori. She's uh, the author of maybe you should talk to someone. Her previous book was called marry him the case for settling for Mr. Good enough. I was a, a relatively big part of coaching her while she was writing that book. Um, and I remember her telling me, I think this is where I got the idea. I, I, I quote, my time working with her those years ago is basically she was telling me that she loved what she was doing so much. She basically wanted her life as it was with just a man dropped in it. And the problem is a man takes up space. You can't just drop a guy into your life. Any guy who has his own opinions, own ideas, own schedule, own interests, own hobbies, friends, and family is not going to consent to being number seven on your list. Right? Because what that makes you is very much like some of the guys that you find attractive. You ever meet a really successful guy, some rich, divorced, businessman kind of guy, and he likes his life the way it is, right? He works 50 hours a week. He's a good dad to his kids, da, 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 and he has his regular golf game and his poker game, and he's trying to slot you in somewhere around that 
How does it feel to be that person who maybe, maybe doesn't get a text each day? Maybe gets to see him once a week, every other week. Hey, that's all I can give you. So he might get the relationship he wants if that's really what he wants is someone who's there to sleep with him once every couple of weeks. But what he doesn't get is the full integrated relationship. That's the thing that I think most people crave. And most people would deny themselves because they don't create enough space for that, right? So if you don't like being the once a week guy, the once a week woman to the guy who's too busy for you, don't be like the once a week guy. If you're too busy for men, you don't create enough space for dating and relationships, you prioritize guys at the bottom because your work comes first, your friends come first, your passions come first, and dating and love comes last because why? It's always disappointed you, of course it comes last. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. You never get the thing you're looking for. Create space for dating, make it a, a part of your life that you, we've made all these other things a part of your life. I talk to women who won't miss a day of working out and they can't bother to date online. <laughs> Right. I talk to clients who are in really great shape, who take their health really seriously. All right. But dating, that's bottom. Hey, when I meet a guy, that's good. That's not a strategy. That's luck. Luck is not a dating strategy. No more than luck is a strategy to lose weight or luck is a strategy to get a new job. The more time and intention you put behind this, the more likely you are to produce results in a shorter period of time. So another quote before we talk, finish up this article. The relationship, and this is from the article, is no longer an exchange market where two individuals were competitors, but a non-competitive relationship that can maximize joint outcomes. That's what we're going for. Okay, the point of life is no longer just to fulfill yourself. You're seeking something for the team. So love is about teamwork. Right? It sounds maybe mundane, but think about the places where people do great things. It's sports. It's a work culture, right? It's not a zero sum game, right? If two people on the same team are competing, the team's not doing well. If two people at work are competing, the team's not doing well. And so if it becomes a competition for time and resources, I want this. Well, I want this. It doesn't mean that either of them are wrong, but the failure to compromise the us, to, to put the us first, is what sinks most relationships, right? And that's you know, all the cliches about people being good at compromise. I never thought I was terribly good at compromise until I met my wife and I realized, oh, she's really amazing at compromise. And if I'm going to be with her, I have to be amazing at compromise too. I have to do everything to, for her that she would do for me, right? Right now, at this moment, while we're speaking, my wife is away, as I mentioned, visiting her father in Florida. Right? That means I have been with the dog, with the kids, with the meals, with the baseball practice. My wife sent her mom here to drive the kids and pick them up for school so I could be here at work doing my podcast and talking to clients. This is everybody sacrificing for the greater good. Right? It's not about me and my time. It's about how are we going to run this family? How are we going to run this marriage? So everybody feels like they're winning. All right. And when relationships start to deteriorate, you know this, people start to keep score. Well, I sacrificed on this, I gave on this, and now it's your turn to do this, and you can't keep score. It's never gonna work, All right? So it's always how do we maximize our happiness? Because if you've been with a guy, and I promise you have, who works when he wants, and golfs when he wants, and he won't pass up a football game on Sunday, and he doesn't want to spend any time with your family, and he wants to do everything on his terms, you know how small you feel. All right. He's the sun, you're a planet revolving around him, and that is not a successful relationship. Don't be like that guy. There's nothing wrong with having a life. There's nothing wrong with having selfish needs, tempered by the fact that you have a partner who's equal to you, who also has needs, and we put those needs aside, and we make something together that works for both of us where both people can lead even better lives. I can go do my trivia night on Monday nights because my wife says, don't worry, I've got dinner. And my wife could do book club on Wednesdays because I say, hey, I got the kids and 
I will drive my son to baseball practice on early Saturday morning because there's no way she wants to wake up to drive him to baseball practice early on Saturday morning. And it's, right, we, we both win. We both get the life that we want because we're both working for the same team. And I'm only using myself as an example because it's easy. There's plenty of examples of relationships. And they don't, we don't see this as like sacrifice. It's not pain, right? It allows us to lead our most fulfilled freedom filled, expressive life, right? Just because it's two of us working towards the same goal instead of one of us working towards the same goal. I want you to have that. You can have that. So last line, you can't sacrifice for that which is you. His joy is not simply important to you because he's important to you. It is your joy. My wife's happiness is my happiness. My happiness is my wife's happiness. There's no dividing line between the two. If she's, if, if mom ain't happy, nobody's happy. So once you realize that you have a partner who's a giver, who's devoted to your happiness, you devote yourself to his happiness. Now we've got a system. Now we've got a mutually symbiotic thing that's working and producing amazing results. If you haven't experienced that, you haven't even begun to live. I'm glad to help you. So love you love story of the day. Uh, this is from Shelly. I love this. Larry is smart, fun, attractive, generous, thoughtful, and charismatic. Probably the first guy I feel like I could take home and know everyone would like him because he's not a fixer upper. I keep thinking of you saying, I'm not picking a husband rather than rather just trying the relationship on for size like a shoe. I'm sure things will become clearer as we continue to date exclusively. Oh, and yay me. This is an amazing improvement over what I was doing before Love You. Even if this doesn't work out, I know I could do it again and that there are really good guys in New York City. I'm officially an Evan Marquette's disciple. Everything you said worked. Best money I've ever spent. Shelly. Um, I do not write these. I just transcribe them and read them to you. So my name is Evan Mark Katz. Thank you for tuning into the Love You podcast. For more episodes like this, click on the button click on subscribe, ring the bell to be notified when new content comes out on YouTube. If you're on the audio podcast, please leave a positive review uh, or just a review uh, telling me what you think of uh, this podcast because I put a lot of heart and soul into it. And most importantly, if you are inspired by the possibility of having this kind of love, right? I'm a smart, strong, successful woman. I've been spinning my wheels, wasting my time on low value men who, who, who aren't prioritizing me, aren't making me feel like I'm important, aren't putting my happiness first. These men exist. You haven't chosen them. Right? I can help you find them. It's a process. It's a system. If you plug your elements into the system, the system works. All you have to do is go to www.evanmarkkatz.com forward slash apply. Watch my short video on helping you fix your broken man picker. Fill out an application. We'll get on the phone. And, um, well, you can be like one of my love you success stories. Um, I, I get pictures from clients all over the world every single week for people who went through this process, came out on the other end with the same crazy cockeyed optimism that I have, that love is real, that love is possible, and that love can be yours. So thanks for listening. I look forward to seeing you again next week. Bye-bye.